I found a power and I've made it mine. Strength for daily living coming from the vine. Jesus is my friend. I talk with him each day. Speaking to my heart, he guides me in the way. Trusting in his presence ever by my side. Following in faith, I let my Savior guide. Jesus is the power ever in my soul. He is the love that makes the family whole. Families thus united set the church aflame. Thank you. Well, wasn't that irresistibly in love? Mother, daughter. You see the love in their eyes for each other and in their music together. You make beautiful music together, and I want to be one of those saints that go marching in. If we connect with God, our Savior, our Lord, our companion, our friend, the, the creator who loves us more than anyone else, we can be those saints to march in. No matter what our history, no matter what our weakness, no matter what we've done so far to this point, God wants to make us all irresistible Christians to make him attractive to those who don't know him. We all need to recognize our responsibility to let God have me. Well, this message is a really fun message, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. It's out of the book, of course, Irresistible. And I'll be giving some of Jim's background and principles, but then I'm going to embellish. I'm going to add what isn't in the book, my version. <laughs> our examples. And this is with Jim's approval. <laughs> the fountain of irresistibility. For with God, for God is the what? The fountain. Psalms 36, 9 tells us that. But the Bible also says that without God, we can do how much? That all of the works of self are what? Vanity. Useless. God says, I am the fountain. Come, come to me. And do we? Often we do not. We profess to be Christians, but we don't really understand the very core of what a Christian is following after Christ. We forget that we can't do it without him. We forget that the fountain is right there and I can go to him. And so we have scenarios like this. The day before Susan left Stan, her frustration had reached its peak. As usual, Stan had stumbled out of bed at the last minute. He threw on the same clothes that he dropped on the floor the night before, and he dashed into the kitchen to get a little something to eat. Whole wheat pancakes with fresh fruit topping again? Why can't you ever serve me the good stuff, he said. Susan, angry, says, Why can't you at least get out of bed in the morning in time for worship? You know God wants you to be the priest of this house. Forget it, woman, he screamed. I work for a living. Stan dashed out of the door without so much as a goodbye. Remember last night, Jim opened it up with Stan and Susan, the most incompatible couple? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about their story. Susan smarted at these remarks from her husband's, and she tried to put them aside, but her resentment grew towards Stan in her heart, and it bubbled over onto the children. Have you ever done it? I have. Susan began to discipline them, and her oldest turned to her with fire in his eyes and said, Mommy, why can't we fight? You and Daddy do all the time. What lessons are we teaching our children by example? Stunned, Susan withdrew to her bedroom. And I want you to notice in every illustration here, I want you to notice the role of our feelings and emotions and what they play. I also want you to evaluate in your mind with your knowledge of the scriptures of what's the character of Christ and what's the character of Satan and self that is shown through our feelings and emotions and responses. 
because we must evaluate who's in charge. We'll talk about that a little later. Susan, throwing herself on the bed, she wept bitterly over this experience. So tired of this conflict, she pled in her own mind, I just want a happy home. Why can't he love me and be a godly father the way he knows he should be? This just can't continue, she frustrated. She slammed her fist into the pillow, jerked herself off the bed, and went into the bathroom. As she looked into the mirror, she commented to herself, I look more like a miserable shrew than an attractive woman. Then her anger swelled up within her. If only Stan could become a godly man. If only he would play with the children when he came home. If only he would quit going onto the internet when he comes home and read his Bible instead. If only he could be nice, we could have a happy home. She stood there seething in her resentment. There has to be some way to change things around here, she thought. I need to try to help my husband. What can I do that would soften his heart, that I can talk with him and tell him, and we can discuss some of these things? She thought for a moment, and then her eyes lit up. I know. It worked before. I'm going to do it again, even if it only works temporarily. Yes, I'll try. Is this self-leading Susan, or is this God's thoughts leading Susan with her feelings and emotions? Do you see it? Is she going to the fountain of God, or is she going to self's wisdom? Stan came home late that, from work that evening, frowning and grumbling, as was usual. He plopped into the easy chair, reached for the TV controls, and turned on the TV. What's to eat? No more of that tofu stuff, I hope. Susan snapped. We're having tofu lasagna. Take it or leave it. I knew I should have stopped at Burger King, he growled. Susan was about to tell him off again, as was their habit, but she bit her tongue, her resolve, remember? She had already, he had already tuned her out on the TV and was fully into his football game. She observed him for a few moments. She looked at him and she thought, He's nothing but a giant omiba. Oh, well, we'll see if my plan works tonight. And if it doesn't, I'm out of here. No woman should have to put up with this. What spirit is driving her? Is it God or is it self? The evening passed with Stan in his own world of football and then Susan in her world of children and chores. Susan had worship with the children, put them to bed, did some chores around the house. And by this time, Stan had moved upstairs to the office and was surfing the Internet. Susan showered, perfumed herself, and put on a something special. She tiptoed into the office, and she stepped up behind Stan. He quickly closed the window, but not before she caught a glimpse of an X-rated clip. Anger threatened to explode within her, but she pushed that down and smiled instead. Stan turned and looked at her and gave her one of those up and down looks, you know, and wordlessly Stan turned back to his internet, pretending to check the weather. Susan drew much closer to Stan. She wasn't going to give up yet, and she began to run her fingers through his hair. Stan mumbled, what do you want? Well, it's been a long time. No, I'm not in the mood. Susan stiffened. He'd rather have the internet than me? Suddenly, her pent-up anger exploded like Mount St. Helen. She unloaded on Stan, and Stan unloaded back on her double barrels. The next day, Susan left. Got the scenario? Wherever we find ourselves in our marriage conflicts, the crux issue that needs to be addressed is the same. Jeremiah spelled it out thousands of years ago. It's found in Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils. They have, number one, forsaken me, that the fountain of of living waters, and the second thing, they've hewn them out broken cisterns that can hold no water. What does that mean? What kind of insight can that give to us 
in our marriages to make them better. I want you to see that the true enemy is when self is in charge and not God, when we're running the show and not God. Susan and Stan were both trying to resolve the marriage conflicts in their home in self's way. They were addressing self's wisdom. Stan's was worldly. Susan's was a lot better. Remember, she had all the reforms and she had all the dietary issues down, but she was still doing them without God. So both were doing it in self's way, and it's important for us to see that. We can do what's right and still be without God. I want to look into the cracked cisterns and get some insights into our marriage and our life with God to understand this fountain. Israel excavated cisterns out of limestone rock. So then they would haul water to the cistern or they would collect rainwater to fill them. What would you think if they had access very near to them to a fresh flowing stream, living fountain of fresh water? and yet they ignored it and went to their broken cisterns. What would you think? Instead of choosing the fresh water that's very close to them, they chose the stagnating liquid that was in the broken cisterns. Now let me explain cracked cisterns. I want you to imagine for me what a cracked cistern looks like. Okay, you have this nice big container that can hold water, but there's a crack in the bottom. And in the bottom, the crack is big enough for little insects to come up in there, Um, when the water is in there and it leaks out it leaks up dirt doesn't it and with dirt and bacteria and all that it contaminates the water doesn't it it makes the water diseased or if they're collecting rainwater they're collecting rainwater but they don't put the cap on it judiciously and so without the cap you get insects and you get things off the roof and you get whatever into the water also to contaminate it so broken cisterns is really diseased water that we're drinking Well, if you had fresh flowing water stream that was clean and pure, very close at hand, you would think something more than a cistern was broken, wouldn't you? And they didn't use it? Well, it's easy to see this in the physical realm, but it's not quite so easy to see how that this is us in our marriages, in our walk with God. We're broken cisterns. God is our only source of love, of life and joy. Yet we turn from God to other substitutes. Yes, it's our history. Yes, it's our habits. But we have to evaluate our habits. Are they good habits or bad habits? And God wants to give us that wisdom. We turn where self is in charge instead of God being in charge. Do you do it? It's as natural as falling off a log. All humanity is inclined to follow itself and justify itself rather than turning to God and we might be corrected in our course or God may have a different plan than we feel like doing isn't that true Stan and Susan charted their own course they consulted their own wisdom that self being in charge instead of God it's trying to solve our own problems each blames the other didn't Susan blame Stan and didn't Stan blame Susan if only he or she would change then the problem would be righted right Not as long as self is in charge on one side or the other. We must be realize that our thoughts and our feelings are what we're drinking. Our thoughts and our feelings is the water. Is the source from the diseased, dirty water of our broken cisterns? Or are we going to the fountain to get life-giving water? Is the disease of self ruling instead of God? That's what was happening with Stan and Susan. They are both thirsty for love. Is there any husband or wife here that isn't thirsty for love? I don't think so. I think we all have that thirst. They were both trying to extract or demand love from the other through broken cisterns of self. Susan, too. Susan was calling the shots, wasn't she? Wasn't it self in charge, even though she was doing things that looked a little bit better, but she was doing them without God? Our problem for Stan and Susan is that they were not seeking God, but they brought, I think, water into their marriage. And the results? Neither of them could bring life to the marriage. We need to learn to judge who's in charge. This is the key issue. By their fruits, we can tell whether Satan or Christ is the fountain feeding our actions, reactions. 
James 3, 14 and 15 says it this way. If you have bitter envying, strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom is not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. You see that? God's telling us that who's in charge? You need to evaluate by your fruits, by your reactions to life. Is this Christ-like or another? It was true that Stan wasn't the priest of his home. He was seeking evil on the Internet. This is true. He was outright doing wrong. But Susan wasn't doing any better because she was totally without Christ. She had bitter envying and strife, just like this text, right? If Susan were drinking from the fountain of God, she would have the wisdom and the spirit from above that James 3.17 says is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy. Did she demonstrate mercy? <laughs> and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Think about it. We can see it in Susan, but what about me? You ask yourself that. What would your marriage be like if that verse described both you and your spouse? If it was open, honest, kind communication. If Susan was directed by Christ, how would her reactions have been different? If Stan would have been under Christ, how would he have been different? Can you imagine what your home would be like if you both followed this plan of going to the fountain to get the life-giving water? and having the fruits of the Spirit, wouldn't you find your home to be irresistible? Wouldn't it inspire hope in others as they saw your marriage working? Hmm. Although Stan and Susan were opposites in many ways, they both needed the same prescription, the same treatment for the disease of self. Return to the fountain of living water. Go to God, get your orders, and see that God to be your wisdom. He knows how to balance. Each one's in balance. If I'm in balance to giving in to Jim too much, does God know how to balance me? Yes, he does. He's going to tell me to be more forthright, more open, and, and tell Jim where, where what he does hurts me because I don't do that naturally by my natural inclination. And with Jim, if he's, Jim is going to God, Jim's a strong, stern disciplinarian. He's very quick to tell you where you're going wrong. And he sees it really clearly, and he's sure about that. But if he goes to God, God's going to balance him, and what's he going to encourage Jim to do? Be a little more stern, right? No, soften him down, right? So God will give opposite counsel to you, whatever your imbalance is. Do we need him? Yes, we do. In order for God to be in charge, self has to be dethroned. God can infuse life where there is deadness to kindness, where there is deadness to entering into a conflict and saying what you really think. See the opposites? He can put patience in place of impatience, soft answers in place of wrath. Stan and Susan's wedding, their marriage is like a dry desert right now in this part of the story. But if God is allowed to irrigate it with his Holy Spirit, it will become a lush irresistible garden and so can yours maybe you're not as bad as Stan and Susan but God can improve your marriage as well Jesus is the vine and we're the dead branches let's look at this first principle God is our fountain Luke 10 27 says "Ye shall love the Lord your God with all your heart all your what mine all your strength God wants you, us to give him absolutely everything. Why? He wants us to learn to think his thoughts, to feel his feelings in place of what's natural to us. He wants us to do his will, not our inclination. And it takes time to know God's voice, the voice of my flesh, to choose what's right, and to choose over my thoughts and feelings of what I'm inclined to. Because God will always in, in be encouraging us in the opposite trait of what we're, incl we're inclined to. He is the creator. Loving God means that he becomes my source of love and joy. Here's an interesting concept. My spouse is not my only source of love. Have you ever thought about that? He, is, uh, he isn't, strangely enough. When my spouse is unkind to me, God is a source of kindness that I can turn to, the flowing fountain. 
I can be at peace in spite of my spouse giving me unkindness. Have you ever tried it? Have you ever experienced it? When my, love, my, my husband gives me love, I accept it as from God. I accept it as from him, but ultimately it's God through my husband, right? When I give love to my husband, it's ultimately God through me giving it to my husband. And we must see our source of love is God, so we aren't dependent upon our spouse for our happiness. Think about it. It's God flowing. Now, my being loved isn't dependent upon my spouse, but it's dependent on, on God. In that case, I can be happy in a miserable marriage because Christ is my fountain. God can change my heart. Ezekiel 36, doesn't that tell us that he's going to put in us a new heart, a clean heart, and we're going to walk in his ways? Well, this is what God's talking about. All of our heart, all of our mind. What is our heart? Our heart is our feelings and emotions and inclinations. It's our habits. It's our tastes. It's our appetites. It's our passions. And many of those are perverted because of Satan and 6,000 years of our degeneration from Adam and Eve, right? Right? Well, God has to put new life in us because the old life isn't worth having, right? We need to go to the fountain. The beauty of this concept is it's freeing. It releases my husband from being responsible for my negative emotions. It also gives me freedom because now, irrespective of my husband's mood, I can be happy and cheerful and still be a good mother and not give up on everything in life because my husband and I aren't doing well. It also puts the responsibility of my emotions in my hands before God. I no longer can blame my husband for it. Let me illustrate this. When Jim would get irritated at me and angry with me, my old responses that I learned in the world was I withdrew. I would withdraw to avoid a conflict. Even if I, he was wrong and I, I knew better, I didn't conflict it. I didn't say my, my part. I was just quiet and I took all that Jim said that was wrong in as my fault. And I took all the blame. Well, when I would do that, my habits from my childhood were that I would eat for comfort. Now, I would eat for comfort, and did my eating comfort me? It gave me indigestion, made me more sour. <laughs> because the emotions are all stirred up when I do that. So, my ways, my broken cisterns, isn't this my broken cisterns? My wrong problem-solving techniques. When they're in gear, and I'm eating for comfort, and I'm thinking in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, I ate that because of Jim. He's the one who made me sad. He's the one who made me miserable. And so my weight gain is his fault, right? Is that God's will? No. God wants me responsible for my emotions, my reactions, irrespective of whether he's Christ-like or unchristlike. And God, the fountain, wants to be our power to show us that we can live above the pull of our flesh. I don't have to stay in old habit patterns. And I need to evaluate in my personal time with God, is this really a good problem-solving technique, eating for comfort? Isn't it idolatry? Think about it. I'm bowing to wrong feelings and wrong emotions. Wrong feelings and emotions of self-pity are from where? Satan, self, isn't it? My nature, and that's my natural inclination. Okay, if I'm feeding from self, then I am bowing to another God because I'm not turning to God. If I take this scenario and I learn in this and I say, no, I'm not going to respond that way. God has promised me. He's won the appetite victory. I can overcome it. God will help me be the paralytic that walks the overeater to eat modestly and that what's inclined to eat when for comfort to not eat for comfort but go to God for my comfort does that change my feelings and emotions and reactions yes can that change our marriage can that take away a lot of the heartache and pain we experience in our marriages yes and God will not just leave you alone he wants to correct your imbalance He's going to want me to learn how to go to Jim and tell him what he does. 
and tell him that I'm committed that I'm not going to blame him for my emotions anymore, but would you please do this to help me too? Now you become irresistible and you become a team together with Christ as my fountain. John 6, 35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, never thirst. Come unto me. Isn't that God's pleading all the time? He wants to redeem us from that life of following sin and self that's so natural. He wants to recreate us into his own image. He wants to heal the broken cisterns. He wants to heal my history and my wrong problem-solving techniques because he wants me to be his child. He wants me to be happy when it even isn't happy in my home for that interim until God can get into my spouse's heart. And they do the same. Coming to the fountain, we must recognize, means something else. Very important. It means emptying the cup of the stagnant water, consulting with self, and letting it be filled with the life-giving fountain that flows from Christ, his thoughts, and his feelings. I must first, the Bible says, put off the old man, self's old ways. And I must put on the new man, Christ, right? I need to give up my wrong thoughts and cling to and cooperate with God's new thoughts. His perspective has to be important. 2 Corinthians 5.17 puts it this way. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, not outside of Christ, not Christ with me, but Christ in me. Christ in me is a very intimate relationship where I am saying, Lord, what would you have me to do? Acts 9.6. And I am cooperating. I am thinking his thoughts. I know it's the right thing to do, and I'm trusting he's going to change me on the inside, that which I can't do, my feelings and emotions. And it says, he is a new creature, and old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I must learn to react in the marriage conflicts and misunderstandings as Christ would were he in my place. I must connect with God filter all I think and feel and do through him. Putting off the old man is not listening to self's ways. No, I'm not going to go and eat for comfort. I'm going to go to God, and I can get all that I need, and I will be fulfilled, and I won't need to eat, and he will comfort me as nothing else can. Putting on Christ is tr thinking his thoughts, believing his thoughts, and acting on them as though it already is done. For example, the truth shall set you free. If my habit, my hurtful thought would be, when my husband doesn't love me and I start rehearsing in this vein, I go to God and God gives me a new perspective. What is God's perspective from his word? God loves me. Turn to me. Come unto me. I love you. Who am I going to believe? God or Satan pushing the negative thoughts to rule over me? When my husband doesn't value me, does God value us? God's perspective. What is God's perspective? And think on these things. This is what God wants us to do. Replace the wrong with right. When my husband refuses to understand, does God understand? When my husband refuses to listen, will God listen? And he'll know when I'm telling him the truth or if I'm fibbing a little, and he'll correct the errors. When my husband wants a divorce... I turn to God, and what does God say? Will you marry me? When my husband sees me as low life, how does God see me as his princess? You see? Opposites. I'd like to share a story to illustrate these negative emotions that you can see that they're my enemy, and how God wants to give me his perspective and how he's going to bring us out of old ways and redeem us from self, self ruling over us. Now this is a story on wrestling and I've shared it before but it's such a good illustration and illustrates this process of Christ as our fountain that I'm going to use it again. Jim and I were in town getting our errands done. We were working very well together and I'd go here and Jim would go in that area and do an errand, pick me up and then we'd go to another section of town. And it was very efficient. 
Well, Jim, while you go to the License Bureau, drop me off here and pick me up here. I have three stops in this area. And Jim says, I want you to go to the library for me. Here's a book I need returned, and I have a book there waiting for you to pick up for me, if you'd please. That's when it happened. I want you to notice the influence of our feelings and emotions, our heart, our old ways, the self. I want you to see the role that indicates who's in charge, self or God, according to my thoughts and feelings. Self said, I don't want to go to the library. I don't like to go to the library. It's not fair for me to go to the library. Why is life always Jim's way? Well, now, in reality, in all honesty, it really isn't that way, but it is convenient for me to see it that way right now because it confirms that my feelings, emotions, and my reactions are justified. My feelings compelled me. The lower powers, our, our fleshly ways, are very compelling. They're very loud. They're very forceful. And what is God's voice like? A still, small voice, easy to be missed. But this is my flesh speaking right now. I was inwardly irritated. I was dallying in self-pity, wasn't I, with those thoughts. I was cooperating with them. Feelings of stubbornness grew out of these thoughts. And resentment arose and also grew in my heart, in my feelings and emotions level. And I got out of the car. Jim just drove up to the curb, didn't say anything, didn't ask me, didn't... didn't respond to my saying, I don't want to go there. He just pulls up to the curb and hands me the book, smiles at me. The goal of that man. And I get out of the car. I don't smile. I'm not saying anything nasty. I shut the door quietly. Am I a Christian? We know we're a Christian by our thoughts and our feelings that make up our character. I wouldn't say this is God on my heart, would you? Am I happy having my own way? I am miserable. I want you to know. Thinking selfish thoughts is awful. It's hurtful. It's terrible. And you're compelled to continue going forward. So my mind continues to cooperate in this vein with all of Jim's faults, thinking of all of them. Satan has a really good job of giving us accurate memory of every bad thing that's happened in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. I was roasting Jim. Jim knows I don't like to go to the library. He's using force. That is not from God. Resistance grew in my heart with this thought. Do you see the parallel here? Who, which spirit is leading me, God or self and Satan? He always gets his way. It isn't fair. I'm going to four places now, and he's only going to one. Is that really have any bearing on anything? <laughs> I mean, really? He's going to be 45 minutes doing his errand, and I'm going to be 45 minutes doing my errand. But it's convenient to justify my reaction. Do you see the road I'm going on? Do you see Satan taunting me and making this path and this detour look very inviting? Yes. The voice of my flesh. The enemy is my wrong thoughts and feelings or not understanding this is where I need to evaluate. I didn't understand yet how to sort out my thoughts, but I was learning with this. Not to decide to go to God is to decide to be under Satan. Think about that. I am not a Christian. A Christian follows God. A Christian, as Acts 9, 6, Lord, what would you have me to do? I'm not doing any of that. I am saying with my actions, I will not have this Jesus rule over me. I'm obeying Satan's character. Isn't that his character, what I'm doing? Yes, it is. I'm his subject then. By the, my fruits you shall know who is leading me. Our feelings and emotions are not to be trusted. This is the avenue through which Satan speaks the loudest to us and compels us to do the wrong. I call it the lower powers. The lower powers defined as how Satan speaks to us, and it's through those, all those emotions, feelings, emotions, habits, inclinations, all those that draw us. Obeying them is idolatry. Because God says... You shall not obey them. You don't have to obey your feelings and emotions. You don't have to do what's wrong. I have all the power to help empower you to make your choices be real. 
The higher powers cast a vote as well. The higher powers is how God speaks to us through our mind, through our reason, intellect, and conscience, which needs to be based on the word of God, right? Because this has to be our standard. The Holy Spirit didn't leave me alone through this process. Satan was speaking to me, but God did too, but it's a still small voice. The Holy Spirit said to me when I got out of the car and I was walking up the steps to the library, Sally, it's a little thing. Sally, surrender these wrong desires to me. You can't control them. Hmm. I ignored God. Not to decide is to decide. If I don't turn to God and cooperate with him, I am letting Satan lead me as a master. I didn't respond to God. I ignored him. And look at the fruits of what happened then. I went on roasting Jim. I started to go through the whole 30-whatever years it was at that time, and I decided, you know, last week Jim decided family fun time five days out of the week. Now, I want you to know the reason for that is Jim comes up with really good ideas, and we all really like them. But right now it's convenient for me to see that he had took five times he chose family fun, not anybody else. Last month he told me I couldn't go shopping. Now, I won't tell you the rest of the story. There was a justifiable reason, but right now this is convenient. Last year, he decided our family vacations. And when we were 17 and we were dating, it always did it his way. I was such a quiet little wallflower, I hardly had, a tr I hardly had the energy to, or confidence to speak. <laughs> That's why we did those things. But you see, I'm seeing Jim in a very exaggerated, untrue light. Have you done it? Has Satan led you that way as well as me? I want to stop for a moment and let's look at the Word of God to enlighten our higher powers. Romans 6.16 6, says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto righteousness, or sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Hmm. You see, who's your master? Desire of Ages says, Every soul that refuses to give himself to God is under the control of another power. Mm. Steps to Christ says, All the power of heaven is neutralized when I do not yield up my will. When I don't surrender to God, I am controlled by the giant resentment who instills hatred inside of me. And as I cooperate, this grows. Satan takes control of every mind that is not decidedly under the control of the Spirit of God. Satan cannot force men to do evil, we are told. God has given us at a very great price the freedom to choose. We have the vote of the lower powers that's through which Satan speaks and is perverted and tells us to be selfish. We have the vote of God through his word, through my higher powers, reason, intellect, and conscience to cast a vote to say, you can be holy, you can do what's right, right now, irregardless of your feelings and emotions that are pressing you right now. My will is my power of choice and cast the deciding vote. I have two votes of which way I can go and I can choose. Let's see with that power of choice how that works. God entreated me four times in the library to give to, in to his alternative thought to what I was going, what pattern I was going on. When I was walking up the stairs, God said, it's a little thing. I didn't respond. When I was standing in line to return the book, of course there had to be a line there, you know, to give me another irritation of why I don't want to go to the library. And while I'm standing in line there, God again calls for me, and he says, Sally, it's a little thing. Only this time I responded, it is not a little thing. It is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Who is in charge? <laughs> I'm tiffed. I don't want to listen to God. I, don't, I want him to shut up, right? Isn't that what our flesh wants to do? We do not want God reproving our darling little sins. That's evidence that the lower powers are active and alive. The third time God said, Sally, it can become a little thing. If you look at it from my perspective, I remain silent. Again, not to decide is to decide. God didn't give up on us, and he doesn't give up on you either. Fourth time, he says, Sally, you know where this line of thinking is taking you, don't you? 
do you really want it? Oh, man, that hit my logic really strong. No, Lord, I know where this goes, and it can be hours or days, or it can even go longer than that with this resentment that I carry inside. And then the coolness that's between us, and every time I look at him, I have resentment because these thoughts are rekindled, right? Because Satan reminds me in case I forgot, <laughs> you know? And I chose to surrender to God. I says, no, I don't want to go down that way. Now, all my feelings and emotions are compelling me to continue in that path, but I chose to think, okay, Lord, it's a little thing. Lord, you make it that little thing. When I chose, I gave the exercise of my will and cast the deciding vote. At that time, Christ comes in me and empowers me, and Satan must leave. Jesus subdues the wrong thoughts and feelings. Not always like that. He can, but usually it's a slower process because we have to, God wants us to make lots of choices along the way so that we know that it's him freeing us and not, uh, not our own flesh itself. Until James 4, 7 occurred, that it says that when I draw nigh to God, he draws nigh to me, and the devil must flee from me. <sighs> no more tauntings, right? Mount of Blessing says, Our will, our choice, is to be yielded to God that we may receive it again, purified and refined. However bitter, however painful this surrender may appear to the willful, wayward heart, yet it is profitable for thee. That's what I was going through. I want you to look at how I cooperate. I want you to see the, the little core, the, the, the meat of the message here. Number one, I chose to think... God's thoughts. It is a little thing. I asked God to change me now. I gave him permission. I'm not in charge anymore. Lord, you're in charge of my life. My heart is yours to redeem. And God led me with a thought in my mind. He used the replacement principle. And he says, Sally, we must replace those wrong fleshly thoughts that you're thinking presently. And I want to replace them with heavenly thoughts. So I want you to think of some good thoughts about Jim. Good, okay. Yes, I'm going to follow the Lord. My feelings and my thoughts come up. Yeah, you know, he did this then. And, and I'm still in the roasting mode, you know. It's kind of still hanging around. And so I've got the new book now, and I'm out of the library, and I'm walking on the way to my other three stops. And in that process, I'm thinking, something good about Jim. I know there's something good about Jim. There's lots of good things about Jim. Lord, I can't think of a thing. Can you help me? And he says, oh, remember how he rubs your shoulders when you're at the computer? Oh, yeah, that is so nice. And, you know, he's just excellent on maintenance issues. He keeps the yard neat and orderly, and, he, and he's always watching out for me. You know, sometimes it might be an irritant that he's worried about me if I don't call just at the right time, you know, or if I forget. But, you know, he's really concerned about me. He wants to know that I'm safe. You know, and that's a good thing. And, and so I went and did my three errands, and God continued me in this exercise process that when I met Jim, you know what I did? I told him all about my wrestlings. I told him all about what I thought about him and how, what aligned thoughts they were and that how God understood and how God gave me freedom from all of this negativity and the giant despair. When I cooperated with God, when I went to the flowing fountain, his, the fountain gave me life-giving water, a new life, new thoughts and feelings. Now, what if I hadn't cooperated with God? How would I have met Jim in the car? You know it because you've done it, right? <laughs> that cold air, and who knows how long that would have lasted. And that would have been my own doing, wouldn't it? I like 2 Corinthians 10, 5. It summarizes what took place. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Wouldn't that make your marriage all you want it to be? We have to learn to surrender and cooperate in this way with God. And this will make me irresistible in my marriage. And if we both do it, how wonderful. Learning that the first principle of connection with God, he is the fountain, the life source of love and life of whatever I so choose to be in my life. 
can revitalize our marriage and set you free to be all that God wants you to be, husband or wife. And this can rev revitalize your marriage. Are you choosing right over wrong? Do you understand that the conflict is in your mind, at the level of your thoughts, your feelings and emotions? That's where God wants to get in and redeem you so that you can serve him the same as he did for Israel of old in the wilderness. It's only a choice and connection away, this life-giving, powerful water. God can equip you to more deeply connect with your spouse. As a physician, he'll heal the negative emotions you're inclined to follow after. He'll heal those hurts and replace the wrong thoughts. As a counselor, he'll teach you how to respond in each given situation. And they're not always the same. One time he wants you to be silent when you're ready to speak. The next time, God wants you to speak when you don't feel capable of speaking at all. You must go to God in each situation to teach you how to filter all you think and feel through him first. He will teach you how to resolve irresolvable situations in your marriage. Do you see how God can make your marriage sparkle? God increases our love first by getting the junk out, getting the hurt and, the, and getting the wrong perspectives out. It's like pulling weeds in our garden so that only the, the healthy plants flourish, right? His involvement will not diminish our delight but enlarge it. God involved in your marriage will make it sparkle. Let's go back to see what Stan and Susan did as they learned and understood this first principle and applied it. After this principle was explained, Jim explained it to them. He called them to a decision. They were on the telephone together. Stan and Susan, the first step is very simple. For the next 90 days, I want you to say, not say anything, not do anything, until you first filter it through God to know what God wants you to do with your spouse. He needs to become your wisdom and your life. You are to become swift to hear God's voice and slow to respond to your fleshly voice, James 1.19. God has given you a conscience, and in the next 90 days, we want to educate and reactivate your conscience so that the lightest whisper of Jesus will move your soul into the actions that will be meaningful to your spouse. Loving God means obeying his direction in accordance to his word. Don't fear this change. Rather go forward trusting Jesus. Jump the cliff. Sometimes it feels like that against what's natural. And trust God. You begin, Jim said, by spending time with God. At the beginning and the end of every day. It's by spending time with God that you, contemplating the principles of his word that the Holy Spirit can impress the interpretation upon your heart of what he'd have you to do. Susan interrupted Jim. Jim, I already do that. I spend a couple hours every day praying and reading and studying, but it doesn't change me. Jim says, I understand, Susan. I used to be that way too. I spent time, but I had no power over irritation with my Sally. I began to realize and say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm no longer Satan's. I need you to work in me. I need you to speak loudly for me. I desperately came to understand my need for a power outside of myself. Friends, you cannot be irresistible. You cannot love a spouse when they're unloving, except you have Christ there to do it with you, to accompany your effort. Without him, you can do nothing. I began to grasp that, Jim said. God is there to empower me. I began to recognize his voice to my mind, to my reason and intellect through his word. I began to see God teaching me how he changed my thoughts and attitudes. Does that make sense, Susan? Susan couldn't respond. There was sniffling on the other end of the phone. She finally brought herself together and said, I think I know what you're saying, Jim. I've always felt I needed to do it myself in order to be accepted by God. Is God really there for me? Oh, yes, Susan, yes. This is where faith comes in, Susan, that which is not seen or felt, or, but believed because God's word says it. It's choosing to believe God's promises rather than what you feel, rather than your history, rather than other uh, relationships you've had in your life that have led you to believe, 
develop this misconception. If you will experiment by relinquishing control to God, you will taste for yourself that he is truly there for you, Susan. In your day, maintain a consciousness of God's presence with you. Keep your ear tuned to God for his directions. Implement the principles that you studied in the morning as God directs you and respond to God. Don't think about the old way. Deny the old way and say yes to God instead. That's how you become a doer of the word and not hearer or only. And Susan, it's very important that at the end of the day, you take time to reflect how things went. And don't be afraid to admit where you erred. It's okay. Admit you're angry. Admit you did it wrong. Admit you blew it. It's okay. God wants you to recognize where you stumble so that you can make plans for tomorrow. And he will help you. Did I listen to God or did I ignore him? I like to slip in the tub, take a sauna, go for a walk, just to give a place for my mind to quiet down that God and I can talk this way. And then you will engage with God and learn to turn to him more readily the next day instead of the broken cisterns of talking with yourself. Jim said, Stan, I know that you are not in the habit of a devotional life, but you need to carve out some time with God to... As it is now, you are like a football player scrambling out on the game without consulting the coach, and you're fumbling the ball all the time. If you really want your marriage to have a chance, you will have to take time in the huddle with God. You are not accustomed to reading your Bible or praying, and this will seem unnatural to you, but don't be afraid of it. Just step in and do it with the time. It will become your favorite. And this will make a difference in your family. But Jim, I work for a living. I don't have time for all of that, Stan said. Am I supposed to quit my job and become a monk? Stan, what time do you get off work? Oh, usually between 6 and 7. And what time do you go to bed? Midnight. How do you customarily spend your evenings? There was a long pause. Is God speaking to Stan? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I get the point, Jim. I'm going to have to prune some things out of my day in order to have time with God. Stan, that's turning away from broken cisterns and returning to God. You can't see it now, but you will taste something better than you've ever had before. While Susan was skeptical, Stan was scared to death. Stan could not see it, but he was willing to experiment. He was willing for the sake of the children, for the sake of their marriage, their shallow love that he possessed with his wife, to at least try it for 90 days and see if this was true. And try it, he did. What changed? Let's go into their, their home and see the differences. They needed to redeem their time. We all need to redeem our time. There are a thousand distractions to keep us from God and that which is a, our priority. Simplify your life to irreducible minimum until your marriage gets solid. Then slowly add to the first work. We must see that everything else is secondary to this first principle. And we must learn this. This is the core of what true Christianity is. When Stan was tempted to complain about Susan cooking, God broke into his thinking, reminding him before he spoke of the principles he had read that day. Do all things without murmuring and complaining and disputing. Philippians 2.14 Out of love for God, Stan would eat his meal quietly and thank his wife for all her efforts for healthful cooking. When Susan was tempted to tell Stan that he, what he ought to be doing, God would remind her, let your speech be with grace seasoned with salt. Salt is Christ, right? In me. That you may know how you ought to answer every man. See the Acts 9.6? Circumstances do not have to control you. She did not have to react in anger, hurt, or retaliation. None of the old ways have to rule her unless she doesn't choose to follow God and trust his power. Together they found that God was missing in their lives. And friends, their marriage blossomed from here. Once they got the connection, they understood where the battle really was. They grew better and better, even better than their honeymoon. This was the incompatible couple Jim shared with you last night. So it can be with you. 
Go to the fountain is the first principle. When you seek God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and you let God be the one in charge, when you know you can't do it without him, and you cling as a clinging tendril to God, no matter what your spouse does, that God becomes the priority in your life because you need God, there is in your secret to success. Willing to do God's will and not your own, he will empower your life with divinity to be like him. And God will untangle your marriage and make you irresistible again. I have four questions for you to think on. Do you feel there is hope for your marriage to get better? Do you think that without God, you can do nothing? No kidding, this is such an important thing to see and understand. So many of us try to do it in ourselves, don't we? Like Susan. Well, I thought I had to come to God and be good before he'd accept me. Uh-uh, God knows you can't. Are you willing to enter into the first step? Won't you start with God today, right now? by committing yourself to him. Debbie? God wants every marriage to be irresistible in order to tell the world that Jesus lives and he lives today. Is this on? Oh, it is that. Precious Father, God, we thank you for especially giving us your son. We thank you each and every day for your spirit that you have given to us. May we learn to listen for his voice in every situation so that we can drink from your fountain and not a broken cistern. Amen. Please be with each and every person here, each family, and may they learn that you are with them each and every moment of every day. Please help us to each time that you tell us to do something that we may listen and obey. And we thank you for it so very much and for bringing Jim and Sally here to help us learn how to make that connection to you and to listen each moment of every day to help us in all of our problems and all of our needs. And we thank you for providing that full and free and crystal clear living water and we thank you so much father in your precious son's name